Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you today for giving us this opportunity to be here. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, but more importantly, to be in your presence. To be able to be in a place where, Lord, we know that you are going to minister to us, that you're going to speak directly to us. Lord, the words that are going to be spoken this morning, that they're not just words, they're your words. They're not just some message, they're your message. Lord, this is just not some message for someone else, it's for us. And so, Lord, right now, we, we, we take this moment to focus on you. We take this moment to lean into you. We take this moment to give you our attention, to give you our time. Lord, because not one of us, we didn't just come here uh, to just get a check mark done for Sunday morning. No, we came here because we need a word from you. And, Lord, you brought us here. We didn't walk through these doors by accident. There is no way that happened. You brought us here for a reason, and it's because you want to speak something into our spirit, into our heart, into our mind, into our life that is going to challenge us, it's going to change us, it's going to encourage us, it's going to give us what we need right now, Lord, not only in this moment, but the moments to come, and so Lord, we, we will receive this, it, it starts right now with us, Lord, giving you our, our focus and our time, we know there's an enemy who wants to distract, we know there's an enemy who wants us to dismiss, we know there's an enemy who's going to try to get our minds to wonder. And Lord, we put the enemy in his place by your name, the name of Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray these things in your name, the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. I'm excited you're here. Many of you know that we are in the middle of the series that we are calling Jesus the Storyteller. We are looking at a series of, of stories that Jesus told. He told a bunch of them. You know, maybe if you grew up in the church, as parables. That's what they were referred to as parables of Jesus. He told, he told them often because it was one of his favorite ways to teach. Because he knew that stories... The stories are the language of the heart. We know that. We know that when somebody starts telling a story, you perk up and listen. Uh, and there are many times we check out in conversation, but somebody starts talking about a story, and you pull yourself right back in. I recently told you last week this was going to be the last Sunday we were in this series, and it's not. We're going to be in here for just a couple more weeks. I hope that's okay. Okay. Two of you. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay, because you know what? God's the leading, and he's, he's the one directing, so he's going to have his way. But today, we're going to continue in this theme, and we're going to look at yet another story that Jesus told. And what I want to do is I want to jump right in. I want to look at the story he told, and then we're going to make this make sense, all right? So let's just jump right in. We're going to do a little different. Luke 12 in your Bibles and on the screen behind me, beginning in verse 13. Someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. And Jesus replied, Friend who made me a judge, friend who made me a judge over you to decide such things as this. Then he said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them this story. This is verse 16. Here we go again. He keeps saying that. You see, then Jesus told a story about this series. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have, I don't have room for all these crops. And he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything that you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. This is the story that Jesus tells. He tells this story, and um, it's a great story. And so we're going to make this make sense. You know, it's funny, some things that you recollect. Um, in 1996, I will never forget, I was a strapping young buck of 16. Boy, if I could go back. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Okay. Uh, I had hair then, too. It was awesome. <laughs> but anyway, 16, I'll never forget, uh, sitting in history class, and uh, I had this teacher, his name was Mr. Skeen, and he was an old hippie. Did anybody have any old hippie teachers? No, maybe three of you. Okay, good. Some of you know what I'm talking about. This guy was a piece of work. And we were supposed to go 
learn about history. Rarely did, rarely did we learn about history. When we did, it was always his opinion, which was awesome. And it was so great. But this one day, he had this question. And it's so great because two weeks ago, we have a Facebook page for our, uh, our senior class, for our graduating class. Somebody posted the same question. And I said, I'm actually going to be using this in a sermon in a couple of weeks. And here was the question that Mr. Steen posed. He said, what is it going to take for you to be happy? And this question consumed our class for three complete days. We did nothing but sit around in the carpet and talk. Mm -hmm. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all got the imagery of my teacher sitting on the desk, Indian style. That's him. We're all chilling on the floor. And we begin to talk about this. And so we're going to reframe it like this. It, it was, this is what he wrote on the board. To be happy, I need, and it was a line, fill in the blank. And we just started talking about this for day after day after day. And the conversations were crazy. It was all over the place, but it was pretty much the same theme. If I could just have a car, if I could just have a wife, if I could just have a girlfriend at that point, but it was talking about maybe long term, if I could just have a boyfriend, if I could just have a husband, if I could just have a career, if I could just have a good paying job, if I could just have a house at the beach, if I could just not live in Virginia, that was one of them, if I could just, you know, the list could go on, as y'all can imagine, the conversations, get the right person, get the right thing, and what was so funny about this, and this is what was brought up on the Facebook page just a couple of weeks ago, was that here it is 27 years later and I guarantee you if the same crew went in the class at North Staten High School, probably none of us could set the floor again in the staff. <laughs> but if we went back as a class and sat down and began to talk about the same question, I don't think too much would change. I think we would pretty much all be sitting around still saying, if I could just have just have that car, if I could just have that spouse, if I could just have that career, if I could just have fill in the blank, then I'd be happy. And Jesus is saying right here, all the things in the world, that list that you're going to make, those things that if you would get, you would be happy. Jesus says, it's not going to make you happy. It's not. That list that you're going to make, that, that fill in the blank, whatever it is, it's not going to make you happy because here's the thing. You're still going to want more. Because once you get that thing, it's going to be another thing that is presented. Look at verses 13 through 15. Then someone called from the ground, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. And Jesus replied, friend, who made me judge over you to decide such things as this? And he said, beware, guard your heart against all kinds of greed. Life is not measured by all the things you own. You see, this guy comes to Jesus and he says, I want you to make my brother divide our estate because I want the good life. And he's thinking, if I can just get money, then I can get all the things I want. If I can, if I can get money, then I can finally, I can finally get that girl. I can finally buy that camel in this situation, probably. We would say, well, I can finally buy that car. I can finally start that business. I can finally go on that trip. I can finally do whatever it is. He's thinking, if I don't get this inheritance, if I don't get this money, it's safe to say, I will be happy. If I get this stuff, I'll be happy. If I don't get this stuff, I'll be happy. And let's be honest, if any of us sat in this room, took this little survey for ourselves of, I'd be happy if, fill in the blank, I need this to be happy. If we're being honest, for many of us, it would, the answer is very clearly, it would be something more. We want something more. And Jesus says it's not going to cut it. The rich man says, well, I can sit back with the bigger barns and with the, the, the more supply, the more I have. I can, he says, I can drink, eat, drink, and be merry. I, I don't know, when, when I read that, that sounds pretty good. He says, now I can take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. That sounds kind of lovely. And yet, verse 21, what does it say? A fool stores up at earthly wealth. But not to have a rich relationship with God, you're going to miss out on this. In other words, what he is doing here is he is issuing a caution to you and me. He's issuing a warning to you and me. And what he is saying is money, things will not make you happy. 
because here is a true statement, and I want you to, it's going to be on the screen behind me because I want you to hear me say this. Enough is never enough. Enough will never be enough. And if you don't believe me, let me tell you why enough will never be enough. Enough is a moving target. It's, it's a moving target. Once you, once you think you're happy, well, something else can make you happier. Once you get that car, there's a nicer one that comes out. Isn't it annoying? They do that to you. It's like they, there's just this, you finally get that car, but it, you're like, it, it's white. It could have been red. Mine has navigation. It's a 14-inch screen, and now there's a 17-inch screen. <laughs> TVs, you get like a 65-inch, and then they come out with a 72. You're like, really? Really? You just have to take it to that level. It's, it's just there's always going to be something. You get a house, and you think it's your dream house, and it's everything that you want. And, and then you start watching HGTV, which I think is like ruined America, maybe. I don't know. I'm joking. It's a great show. But what happens is, is you see something on that show, and all of a sudden you care about shiplap. You don't even know what shiplap is. But now you do. And now you know you have to have it. And it's, this is just what this does to us. There's always bigger, and there's always better. And the quality of life can't be contingent on things. And the Bible says it can't be contingent on things, but rather it needs to be it needs to be contingent on a relationship with God. This is where happiness is going to come from. This is where satisfaction is going to come from. This is where happiness is going to come from. This is where, going back to Mr. Seen's question, this is where the good life comes from. It comes from a sustainable relationship with Jesus Christ. Not religion, not church, not all that stuff. No, a relationship with Jesus. A real connection with him. And this is, there's this theme all throughout the Bible that we talk about often. I begin to ask myself this question, why is it that we talk about this often? And then I started realizing the Bible has a ton to say about this because we have an issue with it, and that is contentment. We have an issue with contentment. And whether we want to acknowledge it or not, this is something that God often addressed with, with the scriptures and in conversation because we have an issue with being content. What it means to be content is very simply this. To be physically or emotionally satisfied with, with things the way they are. Why is it that we can't be satisfied with the way things are? Here's the reason why the Bible keeps telling us to be content. is that we have a sovereign God. A God who is in control of every, not some, detail of our life. In other words, if he wants your career to change, he will change it. If he wants that person in your life, he will send them. If he wants that person out of your life, he will remove them. If he wants you to have that car, you'll have that car. If he wants you to have that zip code, you'll have that zip code. You have a God who's in control of every single detail of your life. Everything that's going on. Yet we shake our fist at this idea that God knows what he's doing. That's really what it comes down to. It's why it keeps coming up in the scriptures over and over again. Is that it's why we can't be satisfied with this idea of realizing that God knows what he's doing. In Philippians 4, Paul is setting in jail, which was a common place for him. It really was. And he's awaiting trial for his life, and he wrote these words. Ephesians 4, 10 through 13, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you haven't had the opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or whether hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who strengthens me. We live in a culture we live in a world that, that bases contentment on circumstances. That, that's why we spent three days on it. We probably would have spent five days on it, but Mr. Steen realized that we've got to learn something at some point. But the reality is, is that it's why we talk about it all the time, is that it's this idea of, again, we base contentment on circumstances. So it becomes this. I'll, I'm happy so long 
ends. I'm happy so long as you're nice to me. I'm happy so long as everything is going right. I'm happy so long as, fill in the blank. Or you can put it this way. I'm good so long as, and it becomes based on circumstances, but what happens is this. I'm good so long as all these things. I'm happy so long as all these things go in that blank. But what happens is, I don't know about you, but my life really goes as planned. Anybody? Like ever. Like ever. Anybody? Okay, two of you are agreeing with me. I want to live your life. It's like if something can go wrong, if something can mess anything up, it's going to happen. It's just, it's just like I, I, I embrace it anymore. It's like I'm just going to, okay, let's go with it. How bad is it going to be? You know? What's going to mess up today? You know? You know, you make these plans, and it's like, this is going to go down this way. This is going to go down that way. Whatever it is, and then it doesn't go as planned. And so here's the problem, guys. When our stability and when our comfort is based on, and our contentment is based on circumstances, we are going to be a complete mess if it's based on those things, because it's constantly like this. It is constantly up and down. And so Paul says, be content in every situation, regardless of what's going on, regardless of what has happened. Now, this is a, a big yet simple statement. It's much easier said than done. Some of us are sitting in this room and you're completely unsatisfied with your job. You're completely unsatisfied with your marriage. You're completely unsatisfied with your children. Maybe there's the loss of a loved one. Maybe there's financial difficulties or they're in a complete mess. Whatever it might be that your life seemingly is falling apart. And you would say, Jason, I'm not satisfied with what I'm looking at. I'm not satisfied with life. I'm not happy with life. I'm not happy with the way things are going. And let me tell you something. This is one of those messages where I'm telling you to be happy that everything's falling apart. This is one of those messages where I'm telling you that you should be put on a happy face and act like that everything is all great when you are completely broken inside. Not at all. I'm not telling you that you have to act like everything is great. I'm not telling you that you should be content and satisfied by things falling apart. But what I am telling you is that you need to understand and grasp that regardless of your circumstance, regardless of what you're facing, regardless of the storm, regardless of the situation in life, we can find contentment in realizing that we have a relationship with a God who is doing what is best for us. That's why he says that all things work to our good, not that all things are good. There's a big difference. All things work to our good, not all things are good. There are situations that we find ourselves in that aren't good. They aren't good at all. But God has a promise. He says, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of your ungood, unideal situation, I am doing what is best for you because I love you. So if you don't have that person, if you don't have that job, if you don't have that car, if you don't have that zip code, if you don't have whatever it is, it's because God is doing something better for you, whether you see it or not. It's one of the hardest things to grasp hold of, that that relationship with him, we have that promise, the good life, we have what we need in him. Psalm 63, verses 1 through 5, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and weary land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and behold your power and behold your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you. As long as I live in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as the richest food, foods and singing lips with my mouth will praise you. When you read these words, you see a guy who's not looking at his circumstances. He's not looking at being thirsty. He's not looking at being hungry. He's not looking at the drought. He's not looking at the terrible season. He's not looking at what he doesn't have. What he's looking at is what he does have. What he's doing is he's looking at whose promises he has access to. What he's doing is everything is pointed to him. He says, you. It is you, O Lord, that all of these things come through by way of, and therefore I look to you. 
the author and finisher of all that is good, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the one of many names. We've got to get to the place where we don't look to our circumstances that constantly change, but we look to the one who the Bible says is the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he's the same tomorrow. We are surrounded by people that are like wishy-washy. We've talked about this all the time. We know that some of you walk into a room and come into the room a completely different person. It only takes five minutes. He's the same all day long. And he's the same tomorrow. And this is something we've got to hold to. We've got to understand, Paul said it twice in Philippians, that this is something that has to be learned. You have to learn this. Meaning, you don't think that you're just going to magically wake up satisfied and content. It's not, it's not going to happen overnight. Don't think that tomorrow, when you get up, that, that you are going to be satisfied and content when the dog runs off and takes off out the neighborhood and takes you the next 48 minutes to get them back to the house. Don't think you're going to be satisfied and content. Don't think you're going to be satisfied and content when you get in the car and you push the button or turn the key and nothing happens. And you're going to be like, praise God, hallelujah. Man, you're good. <laughs> can't wait to see how much this is going to cost. You're so awesome. Don't think that's going to be what happens tomorrow when you open the letter and you see your bank account and it's negative or you get the doctor's report and it's negative. Whatever it might be, but this attitude of being content and satisfied in every circumstance is something we have to learn to do. We have to get there. We have to learn to do it. And so here's, here's, here's how we'll finish. It should take like five minutes. I'll give you three ways right from right here in Paul's writings in Philippians. Philippians 4 that, that, that can teach us how to get there. That can help us learn to be satisfied. To learn to be happy. To learn to be content in every circumstance. And they're not going to be on the screen behind me. I'm going to tell you why they're not going to be on the screen behind me. Because I wasn't even sure how I was going to label them as we went into it. And so you're going to pay attention. So I'd be like, well, no screen up there. I'm sorry. Maybe you'll just write down the own notes. Here's the first thing we gotta realize. We need to realize that we need to wait, be patient, and trust them. We need to wait, be patient, and trust them. We have an issue. I don't know if you know this, but every one of us in this room we have an issue. I'm gonna tell you what it is. We don't like to wait. I don't know about you, but I get like annoyed when I get stuck in traffic. Anybody else? I'm not very Jesus-like when I'm stepping in traffic. I don't like to pull into a drive-thru, a fast food place, and see more than one car in the drive-thru. <laughs> Anymore, I'd be happy not to see a hundred in the drive-thru. Anybody else? I don't like seeing that there's two cashiers with 31 registers and then 14 self-checkouts with a line of 100 people at the self-checkout when none of them know how to use them. <laughs> and I'm like, thank you, Lord, for this afternoon in which I will embark for the next three hours watching people have to have assistants come over and reset it every time because they don't know what they're doing. Anybody else? Okay, good. Well, I'm not the only one. We don't like to wait when we've been praying for something to happen that isn't happening. When God isn't healing whatever it is that we need healed, when God's not mending whatever it needs to be mended, when, when God is seemingly not answering the prayer that we've been praying for weeks and months and even years for some of us. And we have this issue with waiting. You know, Paul, he was the founding pastor at the church at Philippi, the Philippian church, and and he, had, he, he set that church up, and he was a big deal, and they had kept in touch, and then there was some disconnect, and in verse 10, look, look what he says. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord, that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, yet they had the opportunity to show it. Now, some of us are like, what just happened there? Let me tell you what happened. The church sent him a gift. They sent him a gift. He, he hadn't heard from them in a while. 
And verse 18 confirms this truth. I have received full payment and even more, and I amply supplied. Now that I have received it, these gifts that you have sent, they are a fragrant offering, they are acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to the Lord. So on one level, what Paul is saying here in the scriptures is, thank you, I appreciate the gift. It was needed. But on the other hand, if you look back at verse 10, what does he say? At least, at least, now, some of your Bibles actually say at least, you finally care about me. You have finally done what I've been asking you to do. You finally show care. You are finally doing what needs to be done. And what he's essentially saying is it's been a while. It had been five years, actually about ten years, since he had received a gift and any support from them at all. And, and, and here's the point. Paul could have been dissatisfied. He could have been discontent. He could have been like, I don't know about you, but been like, are you kidding me? You, you, haven't, you haven't been supporting me. You haven't been reaching out to me. You haven't done anything for me. And it hasn't been a month. It hasn't been a year. It's been years. And yet nothing has been done. And instead of becoming hostile, instead of becoming discontent and angry and bitter, what does he do? He celebrates because he had patience. He had trust. And who his God was and said, God, if you want me to receive a gift from them, you'll send it. God, if you want me to be blessed by them, the blessings will come. And what Paul had acknowledged and what Paul was telling you and me is this, is that God knew what he was doing and said, Paul, you didn't need that gift three years ago. You didn't need that gift two years ago. You needed that gift now. And now was the time that you received it. And so therefore, now was the time I sent it. And this is something we got to get in our spirit, is that we have to learn to wait on the Lord. We have to learn to be patient where he's concerned, and we have to learn to trust him. And the reason why this is, is because God knows what he's doing. And if he is delaying in your life, if you are seemingly not getting the blessing, if you're seemingly not getting your prayer answered, if the check isn't coming in the mail, if the offer isn't being sent over email, if the job offer hasn't come, it is because God is in control. And I believe one of our biggest problems is when it comes to our contentment and our happiness and our satisfaction is because we sit here and we begin to question why God isn't doing X, Y, and Z. God, why is it that I don't have kids yet? God, why is it that I'm still single? God, why is it that I'm still in this job? God, why is it that I'm still in this house? God, why is it that I'm still driving this car? God, why is it that my kids are still dealing with this thing or that thing? When we've got to come to the point that we realize that God knows what he's doing. He's not the problem. He's the solution. And so that's why we come back to wait on him, be patient, and trust him. Trust him he knows what he's doing. Remember, number two, stuff doesn't bring, doesn't bring satisfaction. Stuff won't do it. We do something called retail therapy all the time. I, anybody don't get that? So some of us are like, I'll just go get a milkshake, right? It's called chocolate therapy. You know, sweet therapy. I don't know which is worse, retail therapy or that. But the thing is, is that we will we'll go buy something to give us this temporary high of feeling okay. At least I can control this. At least in this moment, it, it feels good because I'm getting something new. And here's the thing. Jesus said it in Luke and Paul said it in Philippians 4. Stuff doesn't satisfy. Look at 11 and 12 again. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want. Paul learned this lesson that you and I need to grab hold of. Things, <laughs> they don't make us happy. They don't. They might make us happy for a second. But then there's something else that will make us happier. And we know that. Because there's always something better. And listen, there's nothing, I don't, hear, hear me say this, there's nothing wrong with wanting good things, and there's nothing wrong with wanting new things. Go get the car. You, you deserve it. You've been working hard. Go on that trip. Take it. Go buy that TV. Go ahead. Whatever it might be. But I want you to remember this. Those things will not satisfy you. They will not bring you happiness, and they will not make you content. 
First Timothy echoes this truth and, and Christ's words, verses 6 through 9. Yet true godliness with contentment itself is great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we'll take, uh, we can't take anything with us when we leave. So if we have enough food or clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Does this mean money in the, is the enemy and won't solve our problems? No, money is good. Money is good, and, and we need money. You need money to, to, to live life. But we got to understand something. Money and wealth doesn't guarantee contentment. Money, and, it doesn't. It, it, it doesn't guarantee contentment. Solomon was the wisest, the wealthiest person in history. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, Those who love money will never have enough. Remember, it's a moving target. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. Our satisfaction will never come through things. It comes through him. And finally, here's the third thing. This is how we wanted to be content. We've got to find strength and comfort in him. We've got to find strength and comfort in him. I'll slow down right here at this point because I think it's important that I acknowledge the fact that some of us walk in this room with the weight of the world on our shoulders. You have a lot of weight on your shoulder. Completely discontent and unsatisfied. You're not happy at all. You feel weak. You're struggling. As a matter of fact, as Paul said in jail, bound by chains, he boldly wrote some words that you need to hear, that I need to hear. It's verse 13. I can do everything. Everything through him who strengthens me. In other words, he says, it doesn't matter my circumstance or my storm. It doesn't matter what I'm facing. It doesn't matter the obstacle. It doesn't matter the wall. Christ gives me strength. He's the one who gets me through this. Not me. Not my strength. Not my skills. Not my ways. No, 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 no. None of those things. No, it's Christ. Paul also wrote this, 2 Corinthians 12. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. I love this. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distress, with persecutions, and with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Some of us need to write that scripture down. Some of us need to memorize that thing. We need to put it in our car, we need to put it at work, and we need to put it on our fridge. Because here's the thing, whatever you're going through, whatever the circumstance, whatever the storm, whatever you are facing, whatever the trial, whatever the trouble, whatever the insult, whatever the distress, as the scriptures say, whatever the persecution, you can push through it. Not in your strength, not in your skills, not in anything you have. Not in your house, not in your car, not in your possessions, not in your wealth, not in your health. All these things can go just like that. No, you can push through for him. If you want the good life, if you want to be happy, we know the secret. It is a relationship with him. It's where we find satisfaction. It's where we find what we need. And so how are we going to do it? We're going to patiently wait and trust them. We're going to realize stuff will never satisfy, and we're going to rely on his strength. That's the goal. That's why he told this story. May we embrace this story, and may it impact who we are. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you today for the opportunity we've had to be here, and I thank you today for your word. Thank you that you love us enough to get us, give us what we need when we need it, and today, Lord, we're grateful. We're grateful for the words and instruction that you give us. The charge to not desire all the things of the world, but Lord, desire a rich relationship with you. 
The relationship that changes everything. The relationship that not only sustains us in this life, but in the life to come. And so, Lord, today, we already acknowledge that every one of us was brought here for a reason. Lord, maybe not everything was said for us, but something true of us. And so, Lord, may we not miss it. May we take it into our spirit. May we allow it to challenge us, to change us into a deeper relationship and more dependency on you. Lord, we acknowledge your Holy Spirit who's at work. Lord, your Holy Spirit that right now is, is pushing on our hearts and on our spirits that is showing us areas in our life that maybe we need to change. Lord, we've been so unhappy, we've been so unsatisfied, and we've been trying to, we've been trying to fix this. We've been trying to fix it with all kinds of little things that are all the wrong things. Lord, maybe just go after you. Lord, you said, seek you first. Seek you and all this other stuff will come. All the other things that are needed, you will support. You will meet. Lord, you're a good God. We trust you. And we wait on you. And may you do what needs to be done. Lord, we pray these things in your holy, your precious, and your mighty name. Amen.